Our second game that we'll look at is called Hawk Dove. So in this game, we think about two competing organisms that are exploiting the same resource. And when they get to the same resource and they're trying to exploit it, they'll have competition. And when competition happens, it is either by displays, so an individual kind of puffs themselves up and displays in order to try to win the resource. And we'll term this the Dove strategy because no actual combat is involved or individuals will actually compete with each other by fighting and potentially causing physical damage, and we'll term this the hawk strategy. So when there's a competition between a, a dove and a hawk, the hawks always beat the doves because they're actually willing to cause physical damage and fight. And in fact, in that situation, because doves are aware of this, we'll consider that they don't even do a display. So we have a resource, two individuals show up, they'll either do displays or they'll have a fight to get the resource. And for individuals, a display versus display, or a contest versus contest, there's a 50-50 victory probability for each individual. And then let's think about the following payoffs. So when two individuals get together and they have their competition, the winner that gets the resource will get, say, 50 points. The individual that doesn't get the resource gets nothing. If two individuals fight, the loser is going to get injured, and that injury is, say, worse than having gotten the resource. And then doing a display also takes energy and effort and also has a cost. So what's the optimum strategy if you have a group of hawks and doves? What would be the best for the population, perhaps, or what would be the best for individuals within that population? We can make another one of these payoff matrices like this. So we'll think about this individual here can either be a hawk or a dove, and their opponent, either a hawk or a dove. And of course, conversely, this individual is either a hawk or a dove, and their opponent is either a hawk or a dove. So if a hawk meets a hawk, they have a 50% chance of winning and getting the resource, but they also have a 50% chance of losing, in which case they pay that penalty for losing a fight. And if you figure out the expected result, it's a negative 25. But if a hawk meets a dove, they automatically get the resource. On the other hand, here we have a dove. If they meet a hawk, zero is the result because they have detected that they're facing off against a hawk, so they give up. And then dove meets a dove, there's a 50% chance of getting the resource, and then they pay the cost of doing the display. So the expected payoff is 15. So we have this payoff matrix that we can create that's very similar to this prisoner dilemma one that we came up with. So what is the best strategy for any individual to use? Let's see. So for this individual here, if the opponent is hawk, it's better to be dove. But if the opponent is dove, it's better to be hawk. So now this is a little bit more complex than the prisoner's dilemma because now the optimum strategy depends on what the other individual is doing. There's not always an optimum strategy regardless of the opponent. So the best strategy for individuals actually depends on the frequency of other strategies. So the hawk strategy is better than dove when there are lots of doves, right? Because they'll get this instead of this. But it's worse when there are lots of hawks. If there are lots of opposing hawks, then being a hawk is worse than being a dove. And then this dove strategy, it's better than the hawk strategy when there's lots of hawks, but it's worse than the hawk strategy when there are lots of doves. So which of these is the better strategy depends on what everybody else is doing, and so you get a slightly more complicated situation. So to model this situation, what we'll do is think about it like this. Let's calculate the average payoff, which we can think of as the fitness, plotted against the frequency of hawks in the population. So now let's think about what the dove strategy would be. So this is playing dove here. If there are no hawks, then the opponent would always be dove, and so the strategy would give you a positive 15. Let's go all the way to the end here. So if the population was all hawks, and you're playing the dove strategy, here's the dove strategy. If they're always playing against a hawk, they'll always get a zero. So this payoff, the average payoff is going to decline to zero in a state in which there are all hawks. So you go from 15, if the population has no hawks, all the way down to zero if the population is all hawks. And that's what would happen if you were playing the dove strategy. If you're playing the hawk strategy, if you're in a population where there are no other hawks, then you're always going to play dove, you get the 50 payoff. And then this will decline all the way to the situation where if the population is entirely made out of hawks, every time you play hawk, you get the negative 25. So you have a negative 25 here. So the fitness of the hawk declines, the fitness of the dove declines, as there are more hawks in the population. And when hawks are rare, being a hawk is better.
But what hawks are very common, being a dove is better. And then there's actually kind of an equilibrium right here. So there's an equilibrium hawk frequency, where if you added more hawks, then the hawks are not as good as doves. And if there were fewer hawks, then they would actually be better. So if you think about what's going on, if you were at a population with this many hawks, anytime the hawks increase, now they don't do as well, doves do better, so then the frequency of hawks would go back down to this equilibrium. On the other hand, if you ever reduce the number of hawks, now the hawks are doing better and their frequency would go back up. So this sort of value here is an equilibrium where in the population, anytime the frequency goes up, then being a hawk is discouraged, so the frequency would come back down. Anytime the frequency goes down, being a hawk is favored and it would go back up. Uh, and we can actually calculate what that value is. These are two straight lines. So this is the equation of the line for the hawk strategy. Right? 50 minus 75 times the frequency of the hawk, because you've got to get down to negative 25. And we can set this equal to the 15 minus 15 times the frequency of hawk. That gets us down to zero. Set those equal, solve for the frequency of hawk, just do some algebra, 58.3%. So this frequency here of 58.3% is an equilibrium. And if we think about it, there's no best pure strategy, because it's not always better to be hawk or always better to be dove. It depends on the frequency. There's no evolutionary stable strategy. If you had a population that was all hawks, then any dove that came in would do better, and you'd get invaded by doves. If you had a population that was all doves, any hawk that came in would do better, and you'd end up being pushed to this state. So there's no single strategy that is always kind of immune to being invaded by the alternate strategy. And we can actually see the fitness of these strategies is also frequency dependent. So how do doves do? Well, they do worse if hawks are more common. How do hawks do? Well, they do worse if hawks are more common. I mean, in fact, they would both do better if there were no hawks. But we also know that kind of if there were no hawks, then hawks would do better and they would invade. You'd end up moving to this situation. So one of the interesting things about a game theory analysis of a situation like this is the payoffs and how they change depending on the frequency are going to drive this population towards maintaining kind of a mixed set of individuals. You might expect the population to maintain 58.3% hawks and 41.7% doves. So you get a population where some individuals are hawks, some individuals are doves. You wouldn't get a population where all end up being one or all end up being the other that would last for very long. So one thing to note is that the fitness of individuals at this equilibrium, which is where this competition drives the population to, is actually lower than over here. And this is another example where individual level selection is going to beat out group level selection. The best thing for a group of these organisms would be for all of them to have the dove strategy, because then they would actually have this. But instead, individual level selection is going to drive the population towards this point, where everybody has a lower fitness than everybody would if they were all doves. So selection actually acts to lower the population mean fitness. And that's a really interesting result. Right? We normally think of natural selection as acting to make a population better, and that it's going to result in the best possible situation for the group or the species. But this is a counterexample to that, right? Natural selection will actually push that population towards this mixed set of strategies where the overall population is doing worse than it was before this natural selection occurred. This same sort of argument can be extended to an analysis of sex ratios. So in sex ratios, if we think about a mixed population of females and males, if the population uh, on this axis, we have the frequency of males, think of this as the, the fitness, if you have a population where there are very, very few males, then each male is now mating with lots and lots of females. So the fitness of those males, or like the number of matings they have, is equal to the number of females. Each female is just mating once, so we think about her fitness here. So if you increase the number of males, now if the number of males gets to the point where maybe the entire population is males, all of those males are now competing for the very, very small number of females remaining. Each female is going to produce a large number of offspring, but only one of these males is going to be able to mate with that female. And so each male on average is producing a very low number of offspring. So when the males are rare, those individuals have higher fitness because they're mating with multiple females. 
when the males are common, then they'll have lower fitness and the females will have higher fitness. So the fitness of being male or female depends on how many males or females there are. When males become common, being female is favored, so then you would expect the population to shift back to having more females. When there are more females than males, males are favored, so the population would favor being male and push back here. So we actually end up with an equilibrium here, similar to what we saw in Hawk Dove, but for 50-50, where any time a population got more males than 50%, selection would favor mechanisms to generate female offspring. Any time a population got fewer than 50% males, selection would favor mechanisms to create more males than you would get here. Although we kind of think of a 50-50 sex ratio as being because of XY chromosomes, ultimate reason why we have a 50-50 sex ratio is this process here, this frequency dependent fitness of being male or female. So genes can determine offspring sex. There's no best pure strategy, right? So always being male or always being female is not gonna be the best. The fitness for sex determination strategy is frequency dependent, and we can actually see that there are a variety of different mechanisms for this, right? So in mammals, we have the XY system. So half of offspring are males, half of offsprings are females. In other organisms, sex determination is more complicated. You may know that in crocodiles and alligators, the sex of the offspring is often highly dependent on the temperature that the eggs are incubated at, and it turns out that that threshold temperature is right about the mean temperature that they encounter over long periods of time. So sometimes more males will be produced, sometimes more females will be produced, but over a long period of time, you end up with 50-50. So we can analyze things like having a hawk or dove strategy, or generating male or female offspring using this game theory approach, and we can get interesting results, like our previous observation that individual level selection caused the population to not be as good as it could be, or actually come up with an explanation for why organisms almost always have 50-50 sex ratios. Unless there are other circumstances that kind of make things more complex, which is true for some species, but for a large number of species, this argument holds, and so we see roughly equivalent numbers of males and females.